pleased. I thought that Tom would be a perfect person to uh, talk with Commissioner O'Reilly. I've, I've done it a number of times, and uh, I thought he might be getting tired of, of having Randy May ask him these same questions uh, each year. Uh, and I told Tom to throw him a, a few curveballs, so we'll see whether he see whether he does that or not. Now, at at two o'clock, uh, FTC Chairman Joe Simons is going to be here to deliver the uh, closing keynote. And as soon as my good friend Mike O'Reilly steps up on this podium and gets seated, I'm going to be quiet and turn it over to Tom. <clears throat> Well, thank you very much, Randy. Uh, it is a real pleasure for me to serve on the board of the uh, Free State Foundation uh, because of the great work that uh, Randy and the team do. And it is a great pleasure to have Commissioner O'Reilly here today. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Absolutely, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I think all of you know about the commissioner and uh, the details of his resume are in the uh, program. Uh, but I think it's important to note that uh, he is an outstanding individual uh, for so two important reasons. Uh, the first is, is that uh, his first boss in the Senate was an Iowan, uh, Senator John Kyle. Now, some of you may know I'm from Iowa. And although Senator Kyle represented Arizona, his father was a congressman from Iowa, and Senator, and Senator Kyle was born in Iowa, so we claim him. Uh, the second reason that he is uh, such a great commissioner is because he served in the House Energy and Commerce Committee staff. So although he worked in the Senate, he's really a man of the House. <laughs> and uh, that makes him uh, grounded. Uh, and so that's why he's doing such a great job at the commission. So commissioner, uh, there used to be a bipartisan consensus in the uh, telecommunications uh, policy arena uh, that the more competition there was in the communications industry, the less regulation was needed. I don't think there's a bipartisan consensus on that anymore, but I wonder if you think it's a relevant principle and if it's one you adhere to. Well, uh, bipartisanship, boy, you don't hear that that often these days. <laughs> uh, I, I think generally, yes. I think generally, uh, the, you know, competition solves a lot of ills. Um, and brings enormous benefits to consumers uh, and, and makes my job uh, less relevant. Not all markets are there fully to what people would like, but, uh, but it is, it is, it is uh, an important uh, principle. It solves a, a lot of issues, uh, and the more competition, the better, in my mind. Uh, so if that's the case, then what's your view of the state of competition in the uh, industry today? Let's start with the broadband industry. Well, I, I, th I, don't think, I don't think you can just throw it out there and say this industry versus that. It depends on the circumstances and how you're defining everything. You know, for instance, on broadband, if, it, you know, if, if people define broadband to be I have to have fiber to my home no matter where I live, well, then competition for that is, <clears throat> is probably lacking in a lot of places. In others, there is com competition. You have multiple players. If you're asking broadband you know, in a broader sense and you're willing to uh, concede, as I have, and said that, that mobile broadband uh, certainly, uh, or at least fixed broadband, a fixed wireless broadband is a competitor, then, then you can find a, a very competitive marketplace and a very dynamic marketplace. So to me, it's all about the definitions of how, how, how broadly uh, the market is, is defined. So when you look at it from a consumer perspective, would you expect that, or do you perceive today that, uh, let's say, wireless broadband uh, is competitive to wireline? Uh, and as we move to 5G, will that change? I do believe that many consumers, and I've said this, I don't think everyone, but I do think many consumers believe that their mobile broadband experience is one that they not only use, but in many instances favor over their wireline uh, scenario. Yes, it doesn't meet all, all the same uh, speed and latency require, or, or, or uh, capabilities uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a wireline network, but it does mean the one thing that they really like, which is mobility. Uh, and so they'll trade some of those. I, I think back uh, of, the, of the, the days uh, on on dial tone for basic telephone service. Would, you, know, you had much better service on the wireline telephone network that was attached you know, or connected to your, you know, basically stuck on the side of your uh, kitchen, uh, kitchen wall or in, in your den uh, than you do off your mobile device. But if you look at where, where the experience from consumers and what they're willing to trade off, and they traded 
uh, the, the quality of service on a mobile, on a mobile device uh, for that mobility uh, and the benefits that can come from it. So I believe the two are competitors. I believe they are substitutes and have said as much. Not in all circumstances, but in many they are and they should be recognized as such. So given that, what's your sense of the need for really significant reform of our policies in the various telecommunications industries? Let's start with the cable industry. Oh, I, I talked about this not too long ago and said, uh, I believe that we have to, how we define the marketplace, and that's kind of how I started this conversation, how you define the marketplace is so important. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the video space, it's not just you know, cable or broadcast or satellite you know, offering video services. It's everyone fighting for the same marketplace. And you add, have to add in many of the new, the, the new high-tech companies. The FANGs are fighting for those. You know, it's who wants the eyeballs or the ears and the advertising dollars. And everyone's fighting for that same space. And we have to treat that and recognize that. And the silos that we've, had, we've lived with this so long no longer apply, in my opinion. And we, as, a, as regulators, need to respect that. And we also have to take that message to, to the legislature and, and, and let them know that things need to change. And I have. And I've, I've talked openly about that, how Title VI makes no longer any sense in my mind. And that would be where I would start if I was doing a rewrite. So it sounds like you're saying that uh, what, some of what was discussed in the last panel in a little, little different context, that the uh, differentiation among services and among platforms and among different technologies, it's all kind of breaking down. It's all going away, and, and, and the, to the benefit of consumers. Uh, and there are different flavors and there are different things that can, you, you can get different uh, features and functions depending on the technology. Uh, but in terms of you know, what experience, that, you know, they don't really care uh, if it's a wireline, satellite, fixed, you know, they're willing to, to have the technology uh, not to find their experience. They want the experience for whatever they want, and they really want it to be when they want it um, and, and, and as much as they want. Yet yeah, you're working under a statute which differentiates among all these things. Very much so. And we, we live with a structure, um, the different bureaus, that does the same. And I've argued we need to change that. So I, I, I fully believe that the statute needs to be written, and our structure internally at the commission needs <clears> to change uh, to, to modernize with the current times. Okay, changing topics a little bit. What, what are, you know, just generally, what are your priorities for the next year or two at the commission? Well, I, I, I don't know the, the life of a commissioner any time, right? <laughs> you know, the, 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 they get decided. But, this, but for the next couple of years, assuming that I'm there doing good work, that, you know, I, top of my priorities are going to be getting as much spectrum in the marketplace as I possibly can. I've been an active um, voice on, on a number of different things, including CBRS, uh, the 3.5 to 3.7. I'm um, hoping to make that operational as soon as possible. The GAA or the unlicensed piece, I hope will go, you know, I'd like to see by June, I think I've talked about. And then the licenses, the PALs, I'd like to see those auctioned as soon as possible. It looks like it's going to be, you know, early next year, but I'd like to believe if we couldn't sneak it in, but uh, we'll have to see. I'm, I've been active on the 37, 39, and 47 auction. I, I made a number of deals to, to get added millimeter wave auction. Uh, spectrum with uh, Tom Wheeler, and we've we've made a full plate there, um, and, and it's going to be you know C band. I've been talking about C band for quite a while, and I think you know people look at me and they say, oh, you've been you've been pushing a particular side, and I say, well, I haven't endorsed anything, but I've I've, I've advocated for speed uh, on C band you know C band conversation, um, but I I think that I've done the heavy lifting right, which is I spent two years convincing everyone that C band was the right place to be for 5G mid band play. And now everyone pretty much agrees. Everyone I know is really, the debate is not about should C-band be reallocated. It's really what are the parameters of that reallocation? How much spectrum? How fast? What's the mechanism? And so from my perspective, I feel like I've won. It took me two years to get to here, but I've done a heavy lifting. And now we've got <laughs> the you know, last couple of components to, to solve. Well, congratulations on the victory. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, uh, the C-band coalition. I have, to, I have to be careful. You know, you don't want to get to the point. Right. You know, you, you know, you don't want to be Central Florida uh, and, and and celebrate a, a victory that doesn't quite happen. <laughs> so. Duke was very, very lucky. <laughs> uh, the C-band. They're good too, but Rob, they're good too. <laughs> uh, the C-band um, alliance has been pushing for 200 megahertz out of the uh, for 5G. And uh, do you think that's enough? Well, I've said uh, you could see 
many months ago, I outlined four points that I think are important that would be my measurement of whether success at the end stage uh, was, was, was appropriate. I've said it's between 200 and 300. I would certainly like it to be 400 or 500. 500 seems a heavy, heavy lift. There are incumbents in the band that need to be taken care of, and I don't know that in time frame we're going to get the full 500. I think there's a, a real possibility between 200 and 300 can be made available in a short time frame. And that's why I've said nice things about the CBA, uh, CBA uh, uh, proposal because it has a speed component that I think is really important. It's not just about you know, getting it to market um, and getting it into use. It's also we're competing globally, and this is spectrum that's going to be, um, that, that matches up nicely with other bands that are being used, and that means, that means equipment harmonization, it means spectrum harmonization, there's efficiencies from having done so and, and doing so, and so I, I think it's the, the, the key mid-band play um, and, and that's why I've said nice things about it. But we have some pr particulars to decide and how much spectrum is one of those as well. Yeah, so from your perspective, is it fair to say that it's a little bit of a how much versus how quickly? Yeah, it, well, it's kind of a how, how versus a how, uh, how quickly. I think right now we're in the, 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 the components or the machination uh, or the mechanism is just as important for people um, as is the how much and uh, the other components. So it would take longer to do 400, let's say, than 250. Yeah, but it also depends on whether it's going to be the CBA proposal versus a full-blown incentive auction at the FCC, which will take much longer. So people are, you know, there's trade-offs to head, you know, making those public policy decisions, and we have to think through those. So one of the assertions that has been made is, is that uh, with the uh, uh, some of the C-band proposals that some foreign entities who are owning uh, some of that spectrum could be enriched and that this would be a problem. Do you see this as a problem? Well, look, it, um, the spectrum is in the hands. Uh, in this case, we think it's, it's a prime uh, location for 5G services. So whoever was there, whether they be, uh, you know, homegrown, uh, blown American company or, in this case, satellite company that happens to be uh, you know, I remember these satellite companies when they were, uh, you know, intergovernmental uh, communication organizations, the, uh, the old ICO situation. Right. So the fact that they've turned into this scenario and now people are like, oh, look, it's a foreign, that is, you know, in the 90s I was working to privatize, we privatized them, and now we're mad that they're located in a different place and we want to penalize them. It's, 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 it's interesting to see that, you know, 20 years or 25 years of policies do a full circle. <laughs> It happens. It does happen. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly in the communication space. <laughs> that it is, is true. still funny, though. So in the uh, mid-band, just one more question on Spectrum. In the mid-band, what's your perspective on licensed versus unlicensed? Well, I think that, uh, so in mid-band, if we're talking about uh, the C-band uh, downlink, I think you're either three, the 3.7 the, the three, to 4.2, I think that's going to be licensed. Um, and, and I think where the place to have unlicensed, and I'm a huge proponent of unlicensed, is going to be what we're able to do at 6 gigahertz. Um, you, you probably can't do, I don't believe you can do one without the other, um, and therefore I think they go hand in glove. Um, and that's what I've been able to, you know, work with the chairman, and he was, you know, gracious enough to move forward on a 6 gigahertz unlicensed plan. There are definitely some issues to work through there, but I think they can be worked through, and that's where I think you get both in this scenario. It's not, a, it's not licensed and unlicensed, at, at C-band or downlink, it's, it's having mo both at the package. Whether they move at the same date or not is, is for the chairman to decide beside me. Okay, let's uh, turn for a moment to uh, 5G. Um, a general question. If you read the popular media these days, uh, there's a lot of discussion about whether the U.S. or China will have the lead, well, who is in the lead now and who will be the dominant player in 5G. Uh, do you have any perspective on this? Well, I, I'm not an expert on, on where China is at the exact moment. A number of studies have been put forward that say the U.S. is ahead, the U.S. is behind. I do know we're in a global race with a number of countries, China being one of them. It does so happen that that country has unlimited resources because they have a government system that takes all the money from consumers and all its people and puts it towards whatever the government determines to spend it on. And here they have determined that oh, you know, cornering the market on 5G services going forward is both in their economic interest and also their national security interest. I've said the same thing about the United States. Having a strong 5G play is important for both the economic and national security of the United States. And so I think that is a, there is a global race. I think all of my fellow colleagues have agreed with that. There is a global race to 5G, and I intend to make sure that there aren't barriers to U.S. providers uh, offering 5G services um, to the American people through a private uh, 
private communication system versus a government system. So last fall, I guess it was, the FCC adopted the infrastructure order relating to 5G. There was uh, received, has received generally good marks for that order. Uh, but there are, if you listen to the discussions today, uh, you certainly get the impression that more should be done. Do you think the FCC did enough? Well, Commissioner Carr has taken the lead on some of these things. I have pushed uh, as hard as possible. I think more needs to be done. We need to do more on macro towers. Uh, we've got a, a couple things, you know, we've got twilight towers that have been sitting out there for way too long. These are towers where the, the question was ambiguous from the FCC. We had kind of, it was unclear to providers whether they could set up towers in certain locations and what the process was for getting them approved. And now they're stuck in no man's land. Um, and they can't have anyone co-locate. That would be an enormous benefit. I think, I think the last count, there are like 4,000 of these towers. So something that's been important to me, there are more work needs to be done in this space, and I, I think the, the, the commission is up to the task uh, to address the barriers to offering 5G services. Is that something we could expect in the near term, in your view? Well, it all depends on what you define as near term, but I, I certainly <laughs> Let's say hope so. 2019. I'd like to believe that there, there'll be new items this year. Absolutely. I believe, I believe that we should move new items uh, this year to deal with a number of different fronts on the wireless space. Um, you know, definitional, um, a number of things I've talked to to providers in the space that would make it uh, more and uh, easier uh, to offer services and, and offer, you know, meet consumer demand. So as a market-oriented, uh, Republican-oriented guy, uh, do you feel squeamish about uh, preempting the state and local entities on this issue? Absolutely not. I've given multiple speeches on this. <laughs> uh, I believe that the internet, is, you know, is something that does not respect political boundaries. It is something by in its very nature is interstate. It's actually global, um, and you can't stop it. At, you know, because someone decided in 1800 or 1700 that this river was the, you know, the, the the reason why this state ended, or that you know boundary is designed by this because of that tree that went there. Uh, the, the, the wireless spectrum does not respect. Uh, those boundaries. It is interstate uh, in terms of the other parts of the components. So I'm fully comfortable uh, defending my position uh, and, and respecting state rights on so many different fronts. But here, where I believe that the internet and the basis for cu future communications is uh, interstate in nature, then I am fully willing to preempt uh, those bad actors and those that believe that the state and local governments that believe that they're going to step in and regulate interstate service. So another issue related to 5G that's been getting a lot of attention lately relates to Huawei and to a lesser extent, Z, a lesser extent ZTE. Um, from a practical standpoint, it seems like Ericsson and Nokia are the only other real players in this marketplace. Do they, if, if Nokia, I should say if a Huawei and ZTE are in a sense blocked in the US and, uh, in, and among our allies, or among the allied nations of the US, do Ericsson and Nokia have sufficient capacity to meet the deployment needs of the U.S. and our allied countries? Well, I, 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 and this is not critical, but I would say criti or critical of your question, but you, you, there's a bunch of assumptions in the first part that aren't reflective of my job. Okay. Uh, and so well, I know that, it's not yes, really your job. There'll be some people who make some decisions on whether they should be or shouldn't be allowed to, to serve the U.S. market or our relationships with our uh, our allies uh, globally, but 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 if I take the assumption of your point, do I think that the, the private sector, uh, you know, capitalist uh, equipment manufacturers are capable of meeting demand? I think they can ramp up demand. I mean, you have to put it in mind. There's a reason why uh, our, our U.S. Manu U.S. manufacturing or global manufacturing has shrunk so much. It's because these other these, these two companies that we mentioned uh, or have been referenced have eaten market share and squished. Uh, their existence to now to have basically one when there used to be a, 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 right. a plate of, of U.S. manufacturers and global manufacturers, um, you know, they're one of the reasons why we have so few and why capacity is at such a, such a state. Do I think that they can rise to meet demand? Absolutely. Um, but, I, but I don't have the, you know, the data uh, to, to, to give you to prove my case out front. But my conversations with them, they, they believe they can ramp up as necessary. I don't know what scale will be necess you know, needed depending on how global uh, such a ban would apply or, or, or relations would go. Yeah, so one last question then on this yeah. front. So uh, the FCC is attempting to, through the Universal Service Fund, discourage those who are recipients of that money from using Huawei. Uh, is that the extent of what the FCC can do in your view? 
Well, that's an, uh, first that item's still out for, you know, and, and we've gotten comments and people have, you know, come in and talked about those different issues and talked about what the impact would be for embedded, uh, embedded network components. Um, could there be uh, other things that we would do? It would, you know, there may be, you'd have to trigger some pretty extraordinary provisions in the statute to probably get to, to more than that. that. That's obviously the most direct uh, situation we probably have. Um, but you probably can do some more if you, um, if you're being incredibly aggressive, but I don't know if it's necessary since you, it can be solved or addressed through other government agencies dealing with the, you know, the, 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 the other agencies that, that may have a say in the matter. I don't <laughs> want to get ahead of myself, but it, it may not require yeah. us to be, uh, to, to answer all of those questions, but I right. think there are probably more tools if, if, if it had to come to that, I think. Yeah, I know there are, uh, you aren't going to do the heavy lifting in this case. <laughs> okay, cybersecurity. So it seems like we've been talking about cybersecurity a long time. Uh, you know, from uh, just uh, looking at, the, at it from a uh, non-professional perspective, it doesn't seem as if a lot of progress has been made. Uh, the uh, incidences of cybersecurity breaches seem to be growing all the time. Um, Yet when we see 5G services coming aboard, at least as I look at it, as you look at all these new services from everything from healthcare to you know, uh, vehicles uh, on the roadway, not, uh, uh, non-driver vehicles, uh, it seems as if that the danger of cybersecurity escalates as these new technologies are deployed. So what's your perspective on where we are with cybersecurity and what can be done? Well, in fairness, the Congress hasn't really made that our role. They've actually right. asked the Homeland Security Department to give them specific uh, authority to look at many of these different issues. So I try not to get too far afield from what I've been asked to do. Here, there are a number of statutes where they've been specific on whose job it is. So, but to your point, uh, the larger point, do I think that uh, cybersecurity is increasing or cybersecurity events or incidents are increasing? It's twofold. One, yes, there, there are more incidents and they're also we're more aware of them and companies are more, becoming more forthright on them. They have insurance issues, they have board of director issues. So it is becoming more prevalent in terms of knowledge base. So both parts, more incidents and more knowledge. What do, we, what, what do you do about that in, in the 5G world? I do think it's incredibly important. A number of things are being built into the standards themselves that we can do technology, technologically uh, solutions on that side of the equation. Uh, the second part is that consumers are not going to sign up for some of these, fee these, these new uh, whiz-bang technologies uh, and, uh, without having more uh, comfort um, with where the data may or may not be and how it may be abused. There's only so much I'm willing to use on my, my own self and my family in terms of healthcare data. Um, until I know exactly what I'm trusting. It's been a number of years and now I'm comfortable with the, you know, my, our doctor uses a healthcare portal and we share information and, and that, but it, it wasn't something I would have done 10 years ago and maybe not five years ago. But now I'm, you know, so it takes a little bit of time and also requires a comfort level and, 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 a, and a consistency from the provider, whoever it may be, uh, healthcare, car, technology, ag, and, and name this, this sector, uh, it requires a, a, an investment and a trust factor that, that's something that may not be something that the government can solve. It has to be the provider themselves really having uh, invested the time, the money, the energy, um, and the knowledge base. So the, uh, one of the issues that uh, doesn't go away is the net neutrality issue, uh, which Randy has alluded to several times today. Um, and although it seems that everything's been said on the topic, I guess we'll delve into it just a little bit. It seems as if the D.C. Circuit is likely to uh, act on the case this summer. Uh, so there are so many possible outcomes, I'm not really sure what to ask you <laughs> on the topic. Uh, but from a practical standpoint, will the outcome of the court challenge make any noticeable difference to consumers? Um, not in the immediate day-to-day -day activity. Uh, I was watching the, the, the house markup before I came over. It was an interesting conversation. It reminded me of previous markups and previous <laughs> conversations, uh, as you reference. Um, it, I don't believe that you're gonna, you know, the, the court case will um, have a dramatic impact on consumers on a day-to-day -day basis for the reason that um, I don't think providers are interested uh, in, in doing the bad activities that have been highlighted that they're supposedly going to do. They haven't done them in the past. We, I've gone through why the handful of examples that people always highlight as the boogeyman were not true. 
um, but they still bring those back out every couple of years. They bring the same cases out and say, oh, look at, look, don't forget Madison River, don't forget this Comcast scenario, and you're like, that didn't apply. You know, so you go through all of that scenario. Yeah. Notwithstanding all of that, um, I, I don't believe that the bad activities are, in, are, are, are beneficial for providers to, to proceed forward, um, and, and therefore I think that the, the experience of, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it is only going to be changed if, over a longer time period. For instance, if the court were to, um, to strike our new rules and reinstate the, well, the old rules are still, I guess, hanging out there, um, and there was a ban on paid prioritization, which is you know, something I've talked about a lot, there may not be the benefits of what positive um, paid prioritization experiences may happen. Providers may never build those relationships. They may, may never offer the features and functions from that. And therefore, consumers may lose what, you know, they may not know what they're losing, but they'll lose the opportunity that goes with that. So there are definitely uh, consequences from this activity um, and consequences from the court decision, consequences from everything that we do on the space, but it's not going to be a day-to-day -day basis, in my opinion. Not, not something they feel immediately. No. no. It, it, it depend, depending on who they are, I don't think it's something they're going to feel uh, immediately. It's a longer-term uh, game. So the other thing that's happening is that we're seeing action in the states. In the FCC's oh, sure. order, you attempted to preempt the states. Uh, did you do that well, or could more have been done, or could more still be done? Well, look, and I led the charge on it. I think we did as much as we possibly could. I would have you know, probably added a little bit more. We got to work with my colleagues to make sure everything is copacetic to, to, to get everyone on board. But I, I fully believe in the principles uh, as I highlighted earlier in the conversation, I fully believe with preempting state and local governments, we can't have 50, we can't have 1,000 uh, different statutes on net neutrality. Uh, is an interstate service. We did not, and this is something that is always lost in the conversation. States will say, or, or they filed in many instances, they'll say, oh, the FCC has abdicated its responsibility and left the playing field, and therefore we can jump in. Well, we did not, that nothing of the sort. We did not abdicate the issue to someone else. We said we're going to have a light touch a regulatory model. Uh, we still have some role over the equation, and we have an opportunity to come back if we necessary need to, or have conversation with Congress in terms of asking for more authority. That is something that is our purview. We're not giving it or ceding it to a state or local government to regulate it. And I think all the statutes that have been that are in the works today, uh, we should be aggressively uh, uh, punting out, uh, you know, uh, out of existence. So let's uh, move to another topic quickly, broadband deployment to all Americans. I know this is something you've been particularly interested in. What's your grade on how we're doing? Well, all the commission is. It's not just me. I, um, I, think, my, I think the commission is fully committed to this. It's Chairman Pai has talked about this as top, one of his top priorities, if not the top priority. Um, I, I know he's been traveling around talking about the benefits and, and what, what the, the lack of, of broadband uh, can be in just in the last couple uh, days. It is incredible. The... the, the grade uh, or where we are uh, as a nation um, overall is, is, a, is, is pretty positive compared you know how far we've come how fast but if you're judging it based on you know the last man or the last woman in terms of access then we've got problems because if you look at our last uh, report that's public uh, not the, the one they're working on now but the last one um, just by that measurement and people would acknowledge and I do too that our measuring is terrible at the commission but even if you use our measuring there are nine million locations that do not have 10-1 today, do not have 10-1 speeds. So if you're in that, that universe, uh, there, there are parts of Iowa uh, and other places that do not have 10-1 today, that's incredibly problematic. And those are the ones I, that, you know, if you say, what keeps you up at night? Those are the ones, because they're the hardest <clears throat> to serve. We really don't have a, a ton of money left to, to try and figure out the solutions. There, in many instances, you see fights over, uh, over different technology. I, I, I get complaints anytime someone's, you know, the, the, the number of people that will criticize anytime I use the word satellite as being a solution uh, and bringing forward. But we're trying to figure out how do we serve these people that live, live in really difficult to serve areas? How do we bring service to you and the government being the enticer to bring a provider there? And sometimes it's going to be satellite, sometimes it's going to be fixed wireless, sometimes it may be fiber. Um, and we'll just have to see how it, you know, we're working really hard to make that happen. We've done some really innovative and work, you know, Commissioner McDowell, things I did in my past life on the Hill to get the reverse auctions. I've been working on that for 15 years at least. I'm so excited that we were able to get the CAF Phase Two auction uh, in place. And, and I think we'll, we'll continue to use the reverse auction going forward. And that is something that was really hard to do. And now, in retrospect, looks like, why didn't they do this earlier? Right. 
So the, if I had to give a grade, it's incomplete. It's incomplete until everyone has service. The argument has been like, well, if you make a decision that, it's, that things are in a positive way based on how you do the latest broadband report, for instance, which is before us, um, then therefore you're like somehow if we made a positive decision, we're going to stop, right? Oh, made a positive decision, all done, we're good, we're, we're closed up shop. And I, I, I talked to, you know, to, to Commissioner Clyburn when she was at the commission, former Commissioner Clyburn, and said, it, we make a decision based on the, the current statute and based on the standard, and the next day I'll be right back at it trying to figure out how do I get service to those 9 million locations that don't have it today. So, From a practical perspective, can the private sector do it? By themselves? Uh, without uh, the enticement, I don't think so. I think that's why that's why the government, you know, spends 4.5, or we're going to be over, you know, almost five billion dollars um, in terms of investment from from just the FCC. The government is also the Congress has allocated new funding in both a pilot program of 600 million, um, and also new money in the farm bill. My job has also been, you know, part of the if you've listened to me for the last uh, many months is to make sure these different pots of money don't fund competition in an area rather than spending. Yeah, right you know, the time to those areas that aren't served. Yeah, do you think the overbuilding is a problem? It's a huge and problem. And is it just deterring the private sector from? Well, a lot of these programs are, are just getting up and started, so I don't say that they are the problem yet. Um, and everyone should be on notice that if there are problems that come from, it's just our past experience. Many of us lived through the, 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 uh, the economic stimulus of the Obama administration and know that those dollars, in many instances, did go to overbuild um, I also come and have visited many places where the government has invested dollars to overbuild. Al Arlington, Virginia has, has a built a middle mile network that has no customers or very few. I was in Kentucky and they have a middle mile network that has very little when the private sector had a full blown network that they would have been happy to offer for service for uh, anchor institutions. Everyone wants to figure out how do we do anchor institutions. Well, we have private sector uh, providers that want to offer those because they see the benefit of serving those institutions. Uh, we have people who are building special networks rather than using private uh, private uh, providers uh, today, and that's incredibly problematic. We only have so many dollars. If I've got 10 bucks, I'm trying to figure out how do I stretch that as, as far as possible to get everyone to have a basic level of service. Uh, and it's incredibly, you know, for spending six of those dollars on places that already have um, service and say, well, it'd be better if they had two or three or four or five competitors in that area. It sure would. It'd be great if everyone had a gig to their home or a gig to the igloo or a gig to wherever <laughs> they want. That'd be great, but it's not, in, it's not in the cards right now. And that's not the dollars that we're able to spend uh, and, and be able to stretch them only so far. So I, I really care about that person, that, that location that doesn't have service today. So I think I have time for one question from the audience, if there is a question. If not, I'm going to ask you. Give yourself. We oh, we do have a one. Yes. Yes, sir. Thanks. Paul Kirby with TR Daily. So, Commissioner, you've been critical uh, on a number of occasions about the status of the 3450 to 3550. Uh, I asked David Reddo about that earlier today. I just wanted to get, see if you could elaborate what your frustrations are right now with that, with, with where things are or are not with that, and why you've been so vocal? Well, I, I think why I'm so con, you know, con, um, critical is because we were led to believe uh, multiple layers uh, that the band was something that was going to be uh, converted for commercial purposes uh, from uh, federal government use. Uh, it's, a, it's, a much, it's part of a much broader uh, spectrum band and that parts of that wouldn't be applicable and, and therefore would be more <coughs> problematic to convert. But this is 100, 100 megahertz uh, that we thought and, and were told that was going to be coming over. And at the last couple uh, moments, in, in terms of timing, uh, the message was, oh, no, we're going to now do a feasibility study about sharing in that, notwithstanding that that was supposed to be the clean portion and the other part was going to be uh, open for sharing. And so I feel, and I think I've said I used the word, you know, the rug being pulled within, underneath my feet um, because we were, you know, expecting it to come over. And when you're looking at mid-band spectrum, if you take 100 megahertz off the table, well, then it leaves you, that makes C-band even more important and it makes CBRS um, even more important, and it makes the 70 megahertz that you have for PALS um, that much more important, and it makes the, the 40 megahertz cap look even more ridiculous. Uh, and so I, I, I think that it, the, when you talk to providers, 
um, they're trying to figure out how can I get big, law, you know, big blocks uh, of, of mid-band spectrum. And here's 100 megahertz that we were very led to believe was going to come, come across and be part of the three-prong uh, measure, three-prong offering. And now we're down to two uh, as they do whatever on a study that we'll see, you know, sometime. Commissioner, thank you very much you. for joining us. And most important, thank you for your thank service you. to the country. Very kind. Thank you, sir. <clears throat>